Uh, now we're going to talk to uh, a very interesting filmmaker. He's the guy behind Trekkies, and his new movie is The Nature of Existence. So, wow, uh, that's fascinating. Roger Nygaard's with us. Roger, how are you? Hi, good to, good to be here. Yeah, uh, sorry if I uh, it, it took on too small of a topic this time. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I, I'm fascinated by Trekkies too because I'm I'm a minor Trekkie myself. Um, but uh, well, just admitting it, that's a big deal. Is that right? Okay. Yes. No, I'm out of the closet. Uh, and uh, but the, your two films, I think, are tied by the theme of uh, live long and prosper. Um, so let, let's talk about the nature of existence. Um, that's a hell of a topic. First, just so people know, who did you talk to in the movie and what did you ask them? Well, I, I traveled the world and I wanted to go to the source of all our major belief systems and philosophies and religions on the planet and find experts to talk to and ask them what is the point of everything and collect all their answers and, and put them side by side so you can, we can compare. I talked to Jainists and Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs uh, in India, Taoists and Confucianists in India, of course, uh, uh, Christians and uh, you know in America, and I also uh, talked to Catholics in Italy. Went to the, went to the Vatican, etc. Native Americans, Satanists, and scientists, of course, to get their perspective. Okay, th that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but can you tell us who made the least amount of sense? Or you <laughs> thought, you know what? That's I'd be really surprised if that were true. Well, you know, the more outlandish the claim, you know, I guess uh, Carl Sagan said that, you know, the, the, the bigger the claim, the bigger the evidence you need. And so there are some people making some really outlandish claims. But I don't know if you can say that one claim is more outlandish than the other when they're both are, you know, based on uh, nothing except their own belief in the supernatural. And whether it's somebody, let's say, uh, you know, in, in Israel, there are uh, people who wear little boxes on their heads, right? Is that bizarre or strange? Compared to somebody who, uh, uh, you know, is lighting a candle and in, 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 or, or offering incense to Confucius in China, if you're inside the culture, it seems perfectly normal. But you take a step back, and you're not a part of a culture. It can seem bizarre to anybody. Uh, well, to be fair, uh, God loves incense. Uh, that's that's a well-known fact. And well, you know, they're sending the smoke up to heaven. That's supposed to take your prayer or your offering, take your message up to heaven. So that must mean that heaven is, does not have a no smoking policy. Right. But, I mean, again, to be fair, how else would you get your message to heaven? I mean, don't be silly. Well, we don't have, uh, yeah, we don't have wires uh, up there yet. Western Union hasn't reached that far. Right, and we don't know if they're hooked up to online world or not. And uh, you could Is be wireless in heaven. Right, do we have wireless in heaven yet? <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, well, just one quick note on uh, one of the things people you talk to. What is ultimate Christian wrestling? Well, a friend of mine sent me an email once when he heard I was doing this movie, and he said, hey, you should interview these guys, ha, ha, ha. And I looked at their website, and I thought, yeah, they're perfect. So I tracked them down. They're in Athens, Georgia, or just outside Athens. And they were putting on wrestling shows where they would, you know, wrestle, because wrestling is a battle of good versus evil. You know, That's you got true. good wrestlers, bad wrestlers. And so they felt it was the perfect arena to tell the Christian tale and at the end of every evening they would put on a passion play the lights would go dark and they would and Jesus would appear in the ring and every they, for every show they wrote a new passion play at the end of their wrestling show but i don't get it does uh, Jesus kick some ass does he do, do an elbow from the sky or does he just keep turning the other cheek and getting his ass <laughs> kicked well, in the ring more of the latter you know because it would follow the final match between the main good guy and the main bad guy and the bad guy would get the upper hand and beat the good guy over the head with a folding chair and knock him to the ground. Obviously. And he'd be, get ready to deliver the final blow, and then the lights would go out. They'd come back on, and the good wrestler, wrestler would be replaced by Jesus. And the bad wrestler would see what he's done and then repent, and then that, that would flow into their passion play. Uh, you know what? Uh, on that alone, I want to see the movie. <laughs> okay. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild, wild you know. Trip, man. It was a very successful show for the people attending, I'll tell you. And you mentioned uh, some sect of Orthodox Jews in Israel. I want to go to that. You know, I, I, I'm always amused by that. I, I'm not religious, as you can easily tell. Um, and I think all of them are goofy in their own ways. But did you ask them, hey, do you think wearing these funky get-ups, whether it's the box on your head or the old Russian coat, like that God's going to look and be like, oh, you're wearing just the right outfit, so obviously you get into heaven. <laughs> Like, do they really believe that, or, or is there, they think, well, of course God doesn't judge me on this, but it's a cultural thing. Well, 
that's a very good question, and, and I think well, my answer would be, first of all, is that I think they think that the more they can do right, the better chance they have of making the cut, you know, when it's time for Team Heaven. But an even bigger question to me, which kind of started this whole thing, was I had a good friend of mine who I went to college with who was a pot, pot-smoking womanizer who turned into, converted to Orthodox Jew and had an arranged marriage and now has five kids. And so I, had, I asked him, why do you think or why do you, can you believe in a God that would allow six million of his chosen people to be brutalized and then murdered? You know, how do you rationalize? How do you continue believing in that God? You know, that just blew me away, that concept. Because you have to believe, you know, continue to believe, even though he's done this to can your I, people. R- Roger, can I take a guess? Uh, uh, my guess is that God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> well, you know, it's always going to come down to we can never fully understand his intentions. But they did have a reason. And I'll tell you, you know, when he had to go ask his boss, who was one of the rabbis, and they always talk in parables. So here's a sh- very short parable that he told. If you imagine a man is walking down the street with two children, his own son and his neighbor's son. And he comes to a busy street corner, and they step off, and it angers the father because it's dangerous, so he, he jerks them both back. Which one does he yell at, his own son or his neighbor's son? Well, the answer is he yells at his own son because he loves him more. So the message is that the Holocaust was a message to the Jewish people that they were not being orthodox enough. Yeah, I can't begin to tell you how many things are wrong with that parable. Uh, okay, uh, but I'm not religious, man. I don't believe they're voodoo, so... I mean, so what, God wanted to kill the 6,000 Jews? I mean, does that make God anti-Semitic? No, it's his son. I don't, it's crazy. It's all Well, they take it the next step, you know, further and say, well, the nation of Israel would not have come about had the Holocaust not happened. But, you know, it makes me think, I mean, that's a very small postage stamp of dirt that can barely support life. Why not give them, you know, the state of Oregon or something, if, <laughs> which, you know, is a little more fertile? Yeah, well, we've talked about that a lot uh, in the past as well. All right, so let's get to some of the you know, more existential questions. So there's the goofy side of it for us who don't believe, but we just, it all sounds a little crazy to us. Uh, But for the people who believe within that context, they, you know, I I don't, you know, I I always want to make it clear. I don't believe in the dogma, but I respect the faith, you know, whatever context that it comes in, right? Because I think that's a natural human instinct, and, and, and I don't pretend to know whether it's true or not true, the faith part of it. But on the existential questions, did you get some interesting answers? Did, did somebody have a revelation or, or, an, it, or a principle, et cetera, that made you go, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's really interesting. That, that might be true. Oh, it completely changed how I look at things. After talking to, I talked to 170 people over four years, you know, two-hour interviews, and so you're going to pick up a few things in that much talking. But I really did come to respect the Eastern philosophy and here's the biggest difference I saw between Eastern and Western. In the West, we pray outward to God for things. You know, please help me, please give me this, etc. Please help Grandma. In the East, they meditate inward, and it's about self-realization. God is within you. And it's about living in the moment and the breath and meditation and, you know, breathing yoga, which to me are, seem like healthy, stress-relieving things that, that really does no harm. So... I found that to be uh, enlightening, and, and I, as it forced me, or I really started to pay more attention to each moment in my life. And that's the lesson, I think, is really, if you don't, you've lost that moment. You know, living in the moment is but it's kind of a cliche, but it's very true. We just forget sometimes. Yeah, you look, I risk being a hippie and be, being called even a bigger lib, but I think Taoism philosophy, not religion, the philosophy blows everything else away. I think it's... You know, having looked at all the religions in my own amateur way, I, I think, you know, the Taoist philosophy makes the most amount of sense. Uh, but, you know, you see strains of that in transcendentalism in America, you know, back in the day, uh, Sufis uh, in the Muslim mystic culture. So you see it in all strands. But I, I think they're closer to right. But did, did anyone have a good answer to why do we exist? I found the string theorists, the particle physicists, to be the most philosophical because the religious experts tend to just regurgitate scripture, whereas the, the particle physicists are breaking the universe down to its most basic particles and trying to discover where those little pieces come from. And once you have discovered that, you know where we come from, which is the existential question. And it forces you to become philosophical. And yet even they were about living in the moment. You know, when I asked Leonard Susskind, who is the father of string theory, why do we exist, he said, for chocolate. 
and sex. <laughs> it's Very, true. That's the best answer there is. I mean, you know, enjoy your, a piece of chocolate once in a while. Exactly. And, and, it's, and it's really not that complicated. Yeah, let me throw in something there because, you know, people, uh, I think they're looking at the questions a little wrong. You know, it, it's, um, even if you're spiritual, you know, why did God create us? And they, a lot of people think that it's uh, this giant test. And if you pass the test, then you get to the real afterlife, right? But I think that that's insulting to God if you believe in God. I think God gave you life so that you can live it. He's like, I, I already gave it to you. What are you doing waiting, right? Uh, and, and so, and then on the uh, people who are atheists, you know, Woody Allen has that thing of like, oh my God, we're going to die, we're going to die, and it freaks them out. But to me, that's, that's refreshing in some ways because that makes every day a, a treasure. You know, that, that yeah, they're, they're, we got a shelf life, man. We got an expiration date. And that makes life so much more real. So yeah, if you're if you're doing something with your life, you're exploring, you're learning, you know, you're offering, you're creating something, you're offering something, you're much more fulfilled, and you're going to be much more happy. If you're not creating something in your life, and and many people just default by creating another human, but whether it's a piece of artwork or a math theorem or a radio show, if you're not creating, you people tend to be depressed. Yeah, Roger, you've made two very interesting movies, Trekkies and, and The Nature of Existence. It was a great pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on The Young Turks. You're welcome, yeah, and please uh, you know, check out the film at the, my website, thenatureofexistence.com, where anybody can answer the questions. I'd like to know what everybody thinks. Makes sense, thenatureofexistence.com. Thank you, Roger Nygaard.